Okay, so um, I'm out of town uh, this coming weekend. I'm going to a graduation up in Michigan. So um, we won't be able to do a, any kind of review or anything uh, this Friday. Uh, we could possibly move it to Monday, so we could have some discussions on Monday, uh, but everybody would have to be free. So um, it is Monday an okay day, what time? Do you have other classes on Monday? Monday, I've got, we've got only seminar for me. Um, I, I didn't have any classes. So anytime after, um, no, before two. The seminar at, at three? We, have, we, we usually have seminar at three, un, un, unless it's micro seminar, which, which is 3.30. Yeah. So. I have no class or also. So do we want to meet at 11, at 12, at one? Is there an opinion? Mm. Could we possibly do uh, a little earlier in the day? We have uh, weekly lab meetings that usually around 11 or one, one of the two. So like 10 o'clock in the morning would be awesome if that's possible. Okay, we're gonna do yeah, 10 o'clock. sounds good to me. Yeah. We'll, we'll do 10 o'clock, okay? I'll put it on this. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah. Any other issues? Okay. Um. So I'll put it in the calendar for Monday at 10. And then Tuesday is the last quote unquote lecture. We're going to be discussing um, a paper on thermodynamics of drugs, uh, th drug binding to their targets. Um, and then we'll follow up after that with uh, student presentations. And we'll start talking about a schedule um this coming monday tuesday all right so what we're um going to do uh today is talk about two papers um this is a paper from james lee and serge timoshev in 1977 this was um in vitro reconstitution of microtubules i mentioned some of this stuff uh, when we did the ring formation magnesium induced ring formation. This is looking at effects of solution variables. The introduction to this paper says a lot of the stuff that I sort of told you, um, things about different kinds of procedures for isolation. Um, this lab uses the, the so-called Weisenberg precipitation method. Other methods use um, recycling, so assembly, disassembly, warm cold spins and when you do that you tend to get um, high molecular weight proteins that come along um, and those high molecular weight proteins participate in the polymerization uh, but also stabilize different kinds of ring structures that i told you about um, and then this paper talks about a lot of the history uh, in this first few paragraphs <clears throat> about different observations and different claims that were made by different labs in the 70s and early 80s. Uh, different kinds of tubulin were claimed, the ability to polymerize or not to polymerize. Uh, there were all kinds of things that were said, published, observed. Um, the belief was that the accessory proteins were absolutely required um, subsequently shown not to be true, uh, but they certainly influence what was observed. And so that's what a lot of this introduction is talking about. It's talking about a lot of these observations and what I would call a lot of conflicts. Um, I remember uh, I was still a student when this was going on, and um, at one point, the Borisi group the Kirshner group and the Timoshev group all wrote review articles, really long detailed review articles that were written. 
on microtubules. They didn't reference one another. They just wrote it as though there were three completely different fields. It was bizarre, absolutely bizarre. Um, and so this paper is one of the sort of responses to that opinion or that, you know, connection, if you will. Um, you know, Shalansky was one of the first papers that actually showed that you could polymerize microtubules and in vitro. And um, this business about glycerol not needing GTP was not really true. <laughs> it turned out that there was some ATP in the solution because of the way they equilibrated or didn't equilibrate. And the ATP was what was donating the phosphate to the GTP to allow assembly. Um, the glycerol certainly enhanced stuff. And that was one of the big controversies about what was and wasn't required. There was a lot of controversy about the, buff, the buffers that were used. Um, at the beginning of this class, we talked about a lot of the buffers that um, you can use. And um, we used... Uh, um, various chapters that discuss these variables. I discussed with you the various buffers and how they chelate metals and how that can affect reactions. So in particular, this, this work on uh, microtubules, a lot of the controversy centered around the fact that the goods buffers suddenly became quote unquote essential. And that's what everybody else claimed. And they certainly help in polymerization. But this particular paper sort of challenged it because in the presence of phosphate and the glycerol, you can make perfectly fine microtubules. Uh, and so that's a lot of what the controversy was. So we're going to go through this paper. Um, and I'll highlight some of the things I want to highlight. And then we'll switch to the paper that um, my student, Bojana Vulovic, published in the mid 90s, uh, that was an extension of this work and specifically looking at nucleotide, the role of nucleotides and the role of GTP hydrolysis. So the first experiment that they report here is looking at secondary structure changes um, as a function of conditions. And the question was, do all of these claims about you absolutely must use a zwitter ion or a, a goods buffer, or do you or do you not need GTP, et cetera? What does glycerol do? And they basically looked at secondary structure uh, by CD. You can see these classic minima at 208 and 222. Um, there's some changes in uh, one buffer. Um, I have trouble figuring out which buffer that symbol is looking at, but it, within error, uh, none of the conditions dramatically changed uh, the secondary structure. And I think this line and this line here might've been similar, but this is what is called the aromatic region. We talked about this, and this is the region where you're looking at sort of tyrosine tryptophan. And so what they're basically concluding is within a narrow range, um, there's no dramatic change in protein secondary structure. And so all of the suggestions of the influence of buffers, buffer conditions, um, we're changing something about microtubule assembly. If true, we're not due to some change in local aromatic structures or local um, tertiary structures, alpha helices, beta sheets. Okay. Um, notice here the concentrations being used are in the range of one to one and a half mg per mil. Um, CD especially down here below 200 in the 190 region um, uh, is there's a lot of light absorbed and um, 
for this to work, you have to do experiments in very short path length cells for the secondary structure. And so typically we work, is this gonna let me write on here? We've had a problem with this, there we go. Huh. Um, you work in something that is approximately 0.01 centimeters. So you actually work in something that's 0.1 millimeter, millimeter path length. Okay. The aromatic spectra are usually collected in a one centimeter path length. So these are very, very narrow cells. Uh, depending on what you're using, they're hard to fill and clean. This is just a conventional cuvette style. Uh, although for the CD cell, there's, a, there's a, a particular kind of cell that we use. I've gone to what are called snap cells. They're basically rectangular cells um, that sort of snap together and it has a little indentation in the middle of it. So if the, if the cell looks like this, excuse my drawing, it actually has a little indentation here and you put a solution in here and then you snap another solution down on top of it and it has a holder to keep them tight and that creates the path. So it's a real easy way of filling, although you have to be worried about trapping bubbles and it's a really easy cell to clean. This cell is you know, very easy. Uh, and so the, the secondary tertiary, the secondary um, uh, tertiary structure is not an explanation. Okay, and so that's what this entire first section of the paper is about. Then the paper describes what has become, uh, what became a standard method in the field. Uh, I think some people still do this. It's mostly sort of gone out of vogue as new, new techniques come along. And as we mostly do um, visualization of microtubule assembly. But the method was basically that you start out with a series of concentrations so this is A to E, different concentrations, which they recognize as 1, 1 1.7, 1.9, 2.2, and 2.78 mg per mil. Okay. Um, and so as you raise the protein concentration, you see more and more assembly. And this is usually done in uh, a temperature jump. So right below the 37 degrees, you have your samples uh, at four degrees, and then you initiate a temperature jump. And how you initiate the temperature jump depends a lot on what kind of a device you have. We used to use a water bath, um, and the water bath would, uh, you would switch water baths and suddenly the water would be warm and it would flow around the cell. Uh, and that initiated microtubule assembly. Um, this pertains to what we're going to be talking about in terms of the driving force and the fact that this is a, basically a hydrophobic effect, exclusion of water, burying of hydrophobic surface, and warming the solution initiated that. Um, subsequently, people use Peltier cells to initiate this, although not all instruments had Peltier cells that could jump the temperature dramatically, but that's basically what you did. And then after some lag, turbidity, so notice this is change in absorbance at 350, so I would actually call that turbidity, and we would use wavelengths from 350 to 400, 350 was typical, away from the absorption spectra. And you would see light scattering, okay? And so it often had a lag and then multiple sort of transitions or phases as it would grow. But basically you would wait for it to plateau, okay? You would wait for it to plateau and then you would plot the, uh, the turbidity or the absorbance at whatever wavelength versus protein concentration. 
If done correctly, it would give you a straight line. You would extrapolate that back to the <clears throat> zero turbidity. And that point would be called the critical concentration. It could be C sub C or C sub R or some nomenclature like this. So in this paper, they use C sub R, okay? And so below that concentration, there would be no polymerization. Above that concentration, there would be a polymerization. And in this reaction, what's happening is, I'm gonna to try to write it up here, tubulin nucleates some kind of a polymer. So the lag is the nucleation phase. And then it, what happens is tubulin is now binding to the end or ends of a microtubule with N subunits. And then it would make a microtubule with N plus one subunits. And the mechanism of assembly is a big part of the question and the issue that we won't completely get into. But if you then write an equilibrium constant down for this process, then you would have microtubules with N plus one divided by tubulin concentration and microtubule with N. And the concentration of the microtubules would be constant. You would simply be growing longer microtubules and it would be a distribution of different length microtubules. These images are a little bit ugly looking, but those are basically negative stain images of, of long rods. And so since these concentrations are the same, they cancel. And this equilibrium constant ends up being one over the tubulin concentration, but it would be the point where the critical concentration is. And so the equilibrium constant ends up being one over the critical concentration. And so if you look at this, K is the inverse converted from mg per mil to liters per mole, okay? And so it's one over inverse molar, because that's what that is, that's inverse molar, okay? And then you take minus RT ln K and you get a free energy for the change of assembly. And so this became the standard method, all right? And so this critical concentration at some set of conditions becomes the standard way of measuring what is called the propagation constant. That's why it's called KP for assembly, all right? And the inserts here in figure three are simply to show you that there might be some rings in certain conditions especially high magnesium conditions, but generally speaking, you're growing polymers. The various sort of shapes or phases that you see sometimes are due to changes in structure. So sometimes microtubules nucleate and initially form sheets that then close up into, into microtubules. And the sheets scatter light differently than rods. And so sometimes this is the transition to long rods. Um, I've talked to you about this before. Why is the sky blue? Microtubules scatter light um, uh, with a wavelength dependence um, that goes as the inverse three and a half, 3.3 .3 wavelength dependence, okay? So remember, um, I told you light, light scattered from the sky is basically uh, inverse fourth power of the wavelength. Uh, and so the blue light gets scattered the most and that's why you see the blue. Microtubule rods get scattered with this type of a wavelength dependence and that technique that I asked you to do in one of the problems of correcting for the scattering, that is the method that you use for actually measuring the scattering factor, okay? And so ideally, if it's all microtubules, 
Um, this is discussed in a paper that's referenced in this in this paper, uh, 1974 paper by Gaskin or somebody. Um, and so they measured the polymerization of tubulin in a series of buffers. And notice that what's different about these conditions is that the buffer is different, okay? Otherwise, everything is done at pH seven. So all of these solutions are pH seven. Everything is done with buffer at 10 millimolar and at 37 degrees, that's the temperature jump. You don't have to go to 37, you could do different temperatures, okay? And so these are the extrapolated values and you can see they vary from two mg per mil to 0 0.6, 0 0.5 mg per mil, which expressed in molar units varies from 5.5, 5.5, .5, times 10 to the fourth inverse molar, all the way out to 22 inverse molar. Sorry, that's my phone. I don't know if you can hear that, but I can hear that. Hold on, I got the sound on for some reason. Uh, and then you can see in a free energy scale, the numbers vary from 6.7 to 7.4 kilocalories per mole, minus, say, so they're, um, spontaneous. All right, so this is the first sort of big result. And the result is, is that in the presence of glycerol with some amount of GTP, notice that's about 0.1 millimolar, in the presence of this EGTA, which I told you uh, was involved in chelating calcium, which is inhibitory, and in the presence of 16 millimolar, 16 millimolar magnesium, okay? So all of these others constants, just varying the buffer, within error, they all will make microtubules with the same or similar energetics, all right? So remember the discussion we had early on about in thermodynamics, you vary, you take a total derivative and you vary one parameter, everything else constant. And that allows you to look at the influence of that parameter independent of all of the other parameters. You don't wanna be varying multiple things at a time. Or you wanna be able to write the full derivative out, the full differential and understand what every single variable does. And so this experiment is saying that the buffer, quote unquote, the composition of the buffer does not really change the ability to make microtubules. Now, this is with tubulin purified by the Weisenberg method, but nonetheless, that's the result, okay? All right, and so that already allows them to say <clears throat> that all of those other complaints and all that other sort of criticism about buffer really doesn't stand up. It may, some buffers may be better than other buffers, especially as you raise the concentrations of buffers. You can see here that if you go to higher concentrations of pipes, we typically used 100 millimolar pipes in my lab, although we would occasionally vary that. Um, and that may enhance the polymerization. In this particular case, you don't see a change due to the pipes. Let me come back up here to look at this. The pipes here is at 7.4. So 18 times 10 to the fourth with 7.4 kcals per mole. And down here, it ends up being, so it's in the, it's in the same range. And the reason it's not depending on the buffer concentration is because of all those other factors, that there's glycerol, that there's high magnesium, et cetera. And so they end up being more important than the concentration of the pipes. If we leave out the glycerol, then the pipes concentration does matter. But again, what they're doing is they're basically saying, let's vary the salt concentration, let's vary other buffers. And we basically can make polymers and we have comparable within a, a, an order of magnitude, certainly a factor of two or three, 
the same propagation constant. So tubulin is capable of making microtubules. It's a fundamental property of the tubulin, okay? So the first variable that they look at in some detail besides buffer is temperature. And what they describe in this section is um, how you write out a Van Hoff plot. And you and I have talked about Van Hoff plots a lot, but we're gonna do a lot more of that today and next week. And the Van Hoff plot is usually written in terms of one over temperature. And you know you get an enthalpy and an entropy out of it. But if there's a curvature, you need another term. And that other term is a measure of the heat capacity. Okay, so doing a Van Hoff plot, you'll get, you'll plot the basically the free energy in terms of ln k. Okay, so that remember the free energy is minus RT ln k. All right, and then out of the plot, you'll get an enthalpy, you'll get an entropy. And if there is curvature, you'll get a heat capacity. And it's this third term, the C ln T, that'll give you the heat capacity. So if you make these measurements that we describe up above and you jump the temperature to different temperatures and you determine what the ln k's are and then you plot those as ln k one over t what you observe is curvature in the data okay it is not a straight line meaning that there's heat capacity and these are typical data. This one was done in phosphate at pH seven and all those other variables. Here is simply a list of the temperatures, 23 to 42 degrees, the apparent uh, equilibrium constant, and then the resulting enthalpies and entropies. And those must be reported at one temperature. It must be saying somewhere in here what temperature that's reported at. Table three, where is table three? Summarized in table three, it's not, it must be saying somewhere in here what the temperature is, but the point is, is that the, oh, I'm sorry. This is at all temperatures. Okay, so I, I, I'm misleading you. So notice that the enthalpy at low temperatures is positive and the entropy is positive. And then as you raise the temperature, the enthalpy is positive, but getting smaller. And the entropy is positive, but getting smaller. And then suddenly at around 39 degrees, it becomes negative, but the entropy is still positive. Okay. So that's what the curvature means. The curvature means that the slope is changing, so the enthalpy is changing. And if the enthalpy is changing, the entropy is changing too, okay? So these are changing together, okay? And so that's part of the whole issue. You get curvature, meaning that there's a heat capacity, okay? A change in enthalpy, and the heat capacity comes back in the fitting to be fifth, minus 1,500 calories per mole per degree. So uh, heat capacity is basically due to a number of factors and that will now be discussed. But generally speaking, a change in heat capacity um, is uh, typically interpreted as something that obeys um, the hydrophobic effect, release of water, burying of hydrophobic first surfaces. Okay? Those are two of the main factors that will cause a heat capacity change, okay? And so that ends up being one of the major factors that influences microtubule assembly. You're burying hydrophobic surface, you're releasing water. So there's a change in the entropy, that's the driving force, but you're also breaking all those hydrogen bonds. And consequently, that's a positive enthalpy change. But you can see that it changes with temperature and at high enough temperatures, it switches over to being both entropically driven and enthalpically driven, okay? So next, what the paper then goes into is looking at a lot of other variables. And I, I kind of um, jumped the gun a little bit, but it basically says, okay, what happens if we now change the pH 
and we look at the change in the free energy with a change in the chemical potential of the hydrogen ion concentration, what happens if we change the water concentration, which incidentally is what you do when you add all that glycerol, what happens if you change some other variable? And notice it always has this little holding all the other variables constant, holding water and whatever else, holding proton and whatever else constant, okay? And the observation that comes out of this is that when you change a variable, you can write this down as a change in the activity in terms of the chemical potential being expressed as RTLN activity, um, uh, the concentration basically, but now the correct term, which is the activity of that ligand. And you end up with a change in the equilibrium constant as a function of the activity. And what that gives you is this variable that we call um, delta nu or delta nu bar, or preferential binding. And what that ends up meaning is that how much of this um, component is bound to products minus reactants. So if you have a change in binding, for example, the first variable up above was protons. So if you have a change in binding with a uh, assembly and a change in the amount of proton that's bound, then it will give you the numerical separation or the numerical difference uh, as a delta nu bar, okay? Um, so the one of the examples I show here is let's vary the magnesium concentration. Let's look at the K apparent as it varies. You can see it's driven by, um, it's driven by an increase in the associate or the propagation constant, one over the critical concentration. And then this gets expressed as um, sort of a simplification of the K because the K is a nucleation followed by a propagation constant. And so they recast it as a, uh, an equilibrium constant for propagation. Now, the proper expression for this I have already discussed this in the last paper, involves some water being potentially lost at the same time. Uh, and so that becomes part of the discussion. It usually, because of the, the units used, is a small number. And so even if a little water is either lost or bound during this assembly, um, it doesn't contribute a lot, but potentially you have to take into account the ligand, whatever it is, proton, magnesium, and the water at the same time. And so water is sort of a hidden variable in all of these. And so what you do is you take this expression and you plot LNK versus LNA, and the slope of the line, if linear, gives you this amount of material lost or bound, okay? So that's what, it depends on the slope, okay? Is more bound to product than reactant, et cetera. And so LNK here is plotted versus the magnesium concentration, the glycerol concentration, and the activity of, what's that A plus? Oh, the magnesium is expressed. Oh, I see, I'm sorry. They're showing the plot as a magnesium concentration, but they're also showing you the same plot corrected for activity to show you that the, the plot doesn't change very much with activity. And then they're also showing you a plot for glycerol. Okay, and so you can see that there's an implication. The slope of the line suggests, and notice the sign changes here. The slope of the line suggests that magnesium binds on assembly and the slope of the line is about one, okay? And that glycerol is released during assembly. 
And the slope of the line is also approximately one. The approximate value is 0.78 for the preferential binding of magnesium ion. And a similar thing for the glycerol. Um, notice the use of the term preferential um, that shows up here. Uh, the preferential means the binding is thermodynamic in the general vicinity of. It doesn't literally have to be bound to the protein, but it means the material, the solvent, the buffer that's right up against the protein versus the bulk, okay? And so glycerol, it turns out, doesn't like hydrophobic surface, so it's excluded. Okay, and as it's excluded uh, right around the tubulin, there's preferential hydration that goes on. Okay, and so it's this exclusion of the grist, the glycerol, and the preferential hydration that is part of this whole process. This is the preferential binding mechanism that glycerol usually um, takes part in. Uh, it's described, the terminology that we would describe is that is it's an osmolite. And what that means is it's only really effective at really high concentrations. The, on average, one is being lost, but that doesn't mean that it was bound to the tubulin and released. That means that it's, um, it's enriched in the bulk versus the material co close to the tubulin, whereas the magnesium is enriched close to the, mag to the tubulin, although it probably does in fact bind directly. Okay, so that's the, 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 the general conclusion uh, about what the factors are and how they influence uh, assembly um, at that stage. They then go on to look at pH and you can see that LNK is bigger at low pH than it is at higher pH. So at pH 6.3, LNK is bigger than at pH 7. So the, the pH, the hydrogen ion is also tending to bind. Uh, the slope of this line is also approximately one. I think the slope comes out to be something like 0.8. Um, again, notice it's minus the natural logarithm of AH plus, so it's activity again. And then they do a similar sort of analysis with calcium <clears throat> and with GTP. With the calcium, uh, you get inhibition, okay? So as you raise the concentration, you get inhibition and the LNK goes down. With GTP, you get activation, so it comes up. Uh, these are not straight lines because they really have a direct role in the inhibition or activation. Tubulin has a GTP binding site. It hydrolyzes the GTP during assembly. So there has to be enough GTP around to fill the site and get hydrolyzed or it won't assemble. That calcium tends to bind to a carboxy region on the tubulin and it's an inhibitory reaction. And so once you get above uh, a certain amount of calcium and I may have the, the symbols wrong, but right ordinate open symbols. Yeah, the open symbols is calcium. No, the fill symbols are calcium. LNK, LNK. Well, the way am I describing it is correct. The calcium is inhibitory. the asymptotic value of the, uh, in the absence of calcium. In the absence of calcium, and then this is increasing amounts of calcium. Oh yes, because this is 10 to the minus nine. Okay. Uh, natural logarithm. Okay. So I think I've described that correctly. So the slopes of the lines are again approaching approximately one. Um, these plots in general, this kind of a plot, 
all of these plots are known as Wyman plots, LNK. So this equation way back up here, well, where'd it go? This equation, I'm sorry. LNK, LN something in terms of a delta, this is known as a Wyman plot. And Timoshev in particular uh, did a lot of this type of analysis to be able to get preferential binding, either specifically or, or non-specifically binding, uh, what drives the reaction. It binds protons, so it prefers low pH. It binds magnesium, so it prefers high magnesium, et cetera. Um, and so it's a thermodynamic way of sort of understanding what's going on without really knowing anything about the binding sites. Where is it binding isn't the issue, that there's a change. <clears throat> and it doesn't necessarily have to be a single site. It could be globally across the entire quote unquote system, okay? So that's the general issue. Here's a footnote that tells you something about the activity coefficient of glycerol and how stuff like that is discussed. And then there's a long discussion uh, trying to sort of separate out the role that nucleation might play with propagation and how many equilibrium constants you have to take into account. What if one of these ligands binds to the tubulin and then it assembles? as opposed to it assembles and then binds ligand. Um, uh, there, there's all kinds of details that they go into. Um, and it gets into the kind of the weeds of, you know, if the mechanism is more complicated, then you have to worry about all of these individual steps. We're not going to try to go through that. The general thing that you need to know is, is that this has got the general name of nucleated condensation or nucleated propagation. Uh, it has its origins in uh, some work by Osawa and Kasa, uh, Japanese guys who primarily worked on uh, actin and flagella. Uh, and so they did a lot of the early work in this field in general. And the Timoshev took up this sort of their approach and then applied sort of this preferential thermodynamic approach to solving for these problems. And it was the lore for decades that microtubules polymerized by a nucleated condensation pathway. What the nucleus is to this day is still sort of controversial um, because it's sort of lots of subunits. It's some kind of a sheet structure, but we've never really been able to completely isolate and tell because that delay time involves very few nuclei that then burst uh, and propagate into microtubule rods. And so a lot of the discussion in here is sort of trying to get into the weeds on all of this stuff and talk about energetics and how much things might take and do the thermodynamics that you measure apply to propagation. If the nucleation is just a small fraction of the material, then the enthalpy you measure is really the propagation, the enthalpy of propagation, it's the entropy of propagation, et cetera. And so the burying of hydrophobic surface and the release of water, et cetera, becomes sort of the mechanism. Um, and they get into all of this in great detail to kind of explain how the complexity might in the end work. Um, Subsequently, uh, uh, just a few years later from that, um, microtubule, microtubules were reported. So this is done by Mitchison and Kirshner. Uh, I don't, does somebody in cell biology teach you guys about microtubule assembly? Does somebody lecture on microtubules? It's in the book. Does somebody I think, lecture? Uh, I think Dr. Rauch 
Dr. Rauker did a lecture on it in the cell, the advanced cell biology class. Okay. And that section of the book talks about the Mitchison and Kirshner dynamic instability mechanism. They go over some of the old nucleated condensation material, but the point is, is that the field sort of changed <clears throat> when they discovered that microtubules grow and shrink, grow and shrink, grow and shrink. And that dynamics becomes part of the pathway for microtubule reforming cytoskeletal elements, how it divides during cell division, et cetera. So there are lots of other things that sort of came up. And the field today, uh, 40 years subsequent to the Kirshner Mitchison discovery, primarily thinks about microtubule assembly in terms of dynamic instability. It doesn't mean that a lot of the thermodynamic stuff is true. It just means that the microtubules are not necessarily equilibrium polymers. They're not necessarily steady state polymers because in a, in a solution of microtubules, some can be growing, some can be shrinking all at the same time. It sounds magical. The whole process involves GTP hydrolysis where suddenly it's growing and then it suddenly decides to pause and then disassembly. And it will disassemble preferentially if it runs out of GTP, but even if there's plenty of GTP, there are conformational changes that are obviously going on uh, that change the whole process. So when we started working on this uh, in the, the early 90s, mid 90s, the coal role of GTP hydrolysis was known, but not entirely understood. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is, is that how the GTP hydrolysis and the, the affinity of nucleotide for tubulin regulated that, nucle uh, that dynamic instability was, was still a little bit controversial. And quite honestly, even today, 30 years, 40 years later, um, people still study dynamic instability and claim to have discovered some new aspect. Because when it pauses, people want to ask, well, what's causing it to pause? Why does it suddenly stop? It's growing, 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 and then it just stops. Does it keep growing or does it fall apart? And the answer is yes, it can keep growing or it can fall apart. What makes it decide to keep growing? or to fall apart. And then when it falls apart, does it completely fall apart or does it recover? And what allows it to recover? And so a lot of that is actually still not completely at a mechanistic <clears throat> level understood. So we were approaching this at this time in terms of, well, let's ask questions about how nucleotide interacts with tubulin and regulates assembly. And to do that, you would normally uh, use a, what's called a non-hydrolyzable analog. So you know that GTP, and let's see if I can make this work again. Okay, you know GTP is triphosphates. Okay, so it's got triphosphate. And so the terminal phosphate out here Okay, generally, this is the bond that's cleaved, and this is the alpha, beta, gamma phosphate, and that's what gets cleaved, and it gets cleaved to GDP. And so you would think that if you put a non-hydrolyzable bond here, that that would be a useful reagent. And what we usually use is something that has C, so it would be a methylene. So you would put some kind of a carbon there in between these linkages this way, or you would put some kind of a nitrogen there. 
because they would be uncleavable. It turns out that these um, analogs don't bind to tubulin or they bind to tubulin really weakly. <clears throat> it has something to do with the active site and these just don't work very well. They're not very useful. Instead, it turns out, so if we do an alpha, beta, gamma, that the linkage between alpha and beta, that one is the one that if you substitute this methylene or this nitrogen here, so it's a carbon or a nitrogen with hydrogens bound, those become non-hydrolyzable as well. It's odd because this is what gets broken, but this disrupts hydrolysis. And so it must change the structure of the active site in a way that it can't break this bond. And so these analogs with a methylene or with a nitrogen, <clears throat> so there's the methylene, were used as substitutes <clears throat> and they made non-hydrolyzable analogs, but they would bind with high affinity and they would induce assembly, okay? And so what we did was we synthesized, because you couldn't buy this stuff easily, we synthesized some alpha beta methylene with triphosphate and we made some diphosphate and then we also use GTP and GDP. And we asked, how do these change assembly properties? <clears throat> okay. And so that's what this paper is about. This paper is about asking in a specific way what the role of GTP hydrolysis is by investigating non-hydrolyzable analogs or analogs that do not tend to induce assembly. Okay, and so the abstract describes a lot of stuff. Okay, and so this introduction kind of gives a, an overview of where the field was 20 years later. Okay, and what people sort of knew about dynamic instability and what we thought about it. And then we describe here um, the synthesis, the tubulin purification by the cycling method, the use of the turbidity method that I just showed you in the Timoshev paper, okay? And then the thermodynamic analysis of the turbidity data, where again, the, the one over the critical concentration is equal to the propagation constant. And then you can fit the data because it's curved and you can study the enthalpy and the entropy and the heat capacity, all right? Uh, and I'll describe what the Monte Carlo is about in a second. And then we also did some microscopy, which I won't actually show you those results other than what the lengths are that we looked at. Okay. <clears throat> so what did we do? So there, by this time, had been a lot of work done in the field. Okay, so the Timoshev work is this work. I think it's this work right here. I think it's this number, this data here is the Timoshev work. Okay, uh, that's that square, that, that pound sign, I think, Yes, the data from Lee and Timoshev, okay. All of the data above it are the data that we collected. And then a lot of the data down below are the data from other people in the field. So some people looked at the presence of drugs like colchicine, some people looked at the presence of zinc. There's been a lot of work by this time on the presence of uh, taxol and taxotere. Uh, two compounds that have become anti-cancer drugs that bind to the microtubule lattice and stabilize and suppress dynamic instability. Um, <clears throat> the magnesium reference right here is the Friggin and Timoshev work that we talked about last week. 
Uh, and then a lot of these other projects involve in the presence of maps. So uh, map two or tau. And then there's this work down here at the bottom that was done by Bill Dietrich on fish brain tubulants. So brain fish that live in the Antarctic. Um, most microtubules in mammals assemble at 37 degrees. And so we're associating this with the hydrophobic effect, warming the solution up and it polymerizes. These fish live at minus two degrees. How do they make microtubules? Okay, so they've completely changed something about their sequence and their environment so that they have the same assembly characteristics in, in ice cold water, okay, that a typical cow or pig or human would have at 37 degrees. All right, and so that's part of what we were doing. We're sort of gonna look at all of the different data and see what conclusions we, we could come up with, okay? Now, notice what we're doing. We're doing polymerizations at a given temperature at multiple concentrations, then we're extrapolating the turbidity values to zero turbidity, getting a critical concentration, converting that to a KP, and then plotting those as a function of temperature, fitting the data to get, and that, that those give you free energies, but then fitting the data to get apparent enthalpies and entropies and heat capacities, okay? And here we're reporting enthalpies and entropies and heat capacities. Those must be being reported at some temperature and they're being reported at sort of the average temperature at about 27 degrees in the middle of the whole trace, all right? So what we set out to do was do experiments in the presence of GTP, do experiments in the presence of non-hydrolyzable analogs, and then vary the buffer concentration or vary at glycerol or vary the magnesium concentration and ask questions about how does that affect the parameters, okay? And so this is the Timoshev data, minus 1500 is delta CP. There's a positive enthalpy. There's a positive entropy. This is consistent with the hydrophobic effect. That's also what's reported in Ross and Subramanian. Remember that, okay? All right, release of water, breaking of hydrogen bonds in the water that would be bound to the hydrophobic surface, burying of hydrophobic surface. And then we did it in GTP at various concentrations and do all of the same measurements. <clears throat> and what you see qualitatively is under all conditions, the same thing is true. There's a positive enthalpy, although the numbers have changed a little bit. There's a positive entropy. There's a negative heat capacity, although it's not as big as the, the, the number reported by Lee and Timoshev. The non-hydrolyzable analog gives very similar data. Negative heat capacity, positive enthalpy, positive heat capacity, okay? The error bars come from what's called a Monte Carlo, where you get a fit to the data. So let me actually show you typical data. You get a fit to the data. And so here are examples of what the data look like. This line is the Timoshev data, okay? So you're seeing the Timoshev data, and then you're seeing the results under various conditions. Those are various nucleotide conditions pipes, concentrations, et cetera. And you fit the data and you get an answer. To get the statistics on that, you simulate data, how many points over what temperature range using certain enthalpy, entropy, heat capacity values. And then you simulate the data, but then you add noise to it and then you refit it. And then you simulate it again you add noise to it, you refit it, you add noise to it, you refit it, and you get families of results. And the families of results are what are shown here, where you do this hundreds or thousands of times, and you look at the spread of the enthalpy, the entropy, and the heat capacity that you get. 
That's what gives you the error bar, okay? So this technique, which we call Monte Carlo, is you get a fit to a data set, but then you simulate that pure best fit and you add noise. The noise level that you add depends on what the noise is to the original data set. So if your original data set has noise of 0.3, that's how much noise you add for this particular simulation, et cetera. Okay. And we're not simulating other people's results. We're simulating our results. Okay. So those are the noises that the ones that are shown, maybe those people actually reported values. So the ones that have error bars tend to be the ones that people reported them, or we actually did them by this Monte Carlo method. All right. And the other thing that's worth pointing out here is this shown in this next figure here on the left, is that when you get those error bars, when you get those enthalpies, entropies, heat capacities, you plot them versus one another because you wanna know if they're correlated with one another. So what that means is if you plot the enthalpy in any given simulation versus the entropy in that same simulation, and you do it for all cases, it shows you that in this case, the enthalpy and the entropy are perfectly correlated. Okay, so how do you analyze the data? Remember what you do in a Van Hoff plot. Think about it. You plot ln k, which is actually a measure of delta g, and you get a slope. And then where do you get the, en the entropy? The slope gives you the enthalpy. You plug the entropy into the free energy equation. With the free energy from the K and the enthalpy, you get the entropy. So the entropy is determined by the enthalpy. So they're necessarily correlated. They're perfectly correlated because that's where it comes from. This is a mathematical, what we call a mathematical propagation or a mathematical correlation. It's perfect. And so the entropy is not really, quote unquote, an independently determined parameter. You can extrapolate it back to uh, zero temperature, but it's still sort of determined from the experiment. And so there's some question about its validity. The way that this is usually described is that the enthalpy and the entropy are highly correlated. And so the enthalpy and the entropy compensate for one another. And that's why the, the free energy doesn't change very much relative to variations in enthalpy and entropy. You can see that the entropy and the heat capacity, the enthalpy and the heat capacity have scatter. And so there's some correlation there. You can fit those data and you get a propagation or, or correlation parameter, which may be in the figure. It's um, 0.8 here and 0.8. So you can see that the enthalpy, entropy are both correlated with the heat capacity to a fairly high extent, an R of 0.8. But they're not actually perfect, all right? All right, and so there is a little bit of uncertainty and error, and that's the, what the error bars that are reflected here in the, 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 these axes. Now, notice that the error bars are fairly big, actually. So it's about 33% from Lee and Timoshev, and all of these are sort of in that same range or a little bit bigger. You know, they're about 30%. And the same is not true. The enthalpies and the entropies are better determined, uh, but they're fairly large error bars, okay? And so this is another criticism of sort of a Van Hoff method. You can't determine these numbers that well, and then you have these correlation issues, okay? So the results of those data, let me talk about the table a little bit before we move on. The results of these data is, is that under all conditions, with glycerol, without glycerol, with GTP, with non-hydrolyzable analog, all of these experiments reveal the same general mechanism, that there's burial of hydrophobic surface, 
there's release of water, you get a positive enthalpy, a positive entropy, a negative heat capacity, which is all what Ross and Subramanian in the field in general would say is true, okay? Even in the absence of, hy <coughs> excuse me, of hydrolysis, this is true, okay? And so that's sort of a general observation and the, the results in the data are consistent with all of that. Even if you induce polymerization according to the literature with taxol, you get similar positive enthalpies, positive entropies, negative heat capacities. The magnitudes change a little bit. The numbers change a little bit. That's consistent with different amounts of curvature. Okay, how much curvature do you have? This curvature is due to the GDP, non-hydrolyzable analog. It has the most curvature and is the most problematic in thinking about it. You'll notice that there's sort of a narrower range in temperature because we couldn't polymerize it as well, although it worked. It's sort of interesting that a GDP analog induced polymerization because GDP itself would not work. So this is not really a GDP analog. It's sort of a mimic of both a GDP and a GTP. It's changing the conformation. We showed that in a subsequent paper that that was also true, that that methylene did something to the structure and changed it a little bit, okay? But nonetheless, everybody is more or less the same plus and minus some kind of uncertainty. And so we spent a fair amount of time discussing what all of that means. Now, this is a plot of some taxol data that we collected, okay? And in the background are data from another lab. So let me point that out to you in the table. So this other lab, this symbol here is, uh, I'm not sure what that symbol is. Uh, It's this Diaz paper, 1993. That's Jose Diaz um, in, he was a postdoc at the time in Jose Andreu's lab in Madrid. He's still in Madrid with Jose Andreu uh, at some institute in Madrid. And they did similar measurements with Taxol and Taxotere. Taxotere was one of the new analogs of Taxol that had increased solubility and works quote unquote better as a drug. So let me make this one point and then we'll take a break. Their results are shown in the straight lines. And the results are with taxol and taxotere. I think A is taxol and B is taxotere. Maybe I'm wrong. Hmm. Oh, it's, I'm sorry, A is GTP and uh, B is GDP. The two symbols correspond to ta the, the, the solid line and the dashed line correspond to taxol and taxotere. Yeah, there it is. Solid line taxotere, dashed line taxol. So taxotere assembles better. It has a bigger K than taxol. <clears throat> and then our data is shown on the same data sets. Their data is linear. They do not have curvature. They do not have a heat capacity. Uh, I wouldn't call that controversial. I would simply say they didn't get the same result. We get curvature. It sort of agrees with where their data, it's in the same ballpark, but without curvature. And then I said a few moments ago, GDP will not assemble microtubules but taxol or taxotere will overcome the presence of GDP and make perfectly fine microtubules. The values are a bit smaller. I think you can see this goes up to 12 and this is closer to 11. They're a bit smaller, but nonetheless, they will make perfectly fine microtubules. Taxol and taxotere bind between protofilaments in a microtubule lattice. And so they stabilize the lattice laterally, okay? And so that's how they work, 
Okay, let's take a short break and we'll come back and go over uh, the next issue. Okay, so five minutes. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
Okay, are we back? <clears throat> All right. Um, so what I want you to be paying attention to here, and, and this particular section is sort of important, is that I have shown you questions <clears throat> from past prelims, styles of questions, where I ask questions about Van Hoff plots. And I basically either describe the Van Hoff plot or I, or I give you a Van Hoff plot or I give you an enthalpy entropy plot and I ask you to draw a Van Hoff plot. So what does it mean that the enthalpy is positive, that the entropy is positive, that there's a heat capacity change which leads to curvature, et cetera? And all of that is couched in this type of a plot. The fact that the enthalpy, the L and K versus one over T plot goes down like this. Remember the slope is minus delta H over R. So a negative slope means that the enthalpy is positive. The curvature means that the heat capacity is negative. <clears throat> the negative, excuse me, the positive enthalpy then transitions to a positive entropy. All of that is consistent with the hydrophobic effect. Uh, all of that is consistent with burial of hydrophobic surface, release of water, et cetera. And I give you plots of various kinds. I give you what the slope is. I ask you to draw the right slope, given what the number is. All of that is sort of something that you should be aware of and understand how to interpret. Okay, what's the slope? What's the intercept? What's the curvature mean? The fact that the enthalpy and the entropy are correlated and strongly correlated with one another has been discussed for many, many years. <clears throat> um, what I showed you early on was the statistical mathematical correlation in the simulations that was perfect, okay? Saying that that was really an artifact of the fact that the enthalpy determines the entropy. So they're highly correlated. <clears throat> Back in the 70s, Tom Krug's lab, Tom was um, at Rochester, I think, at the time, did a whole series of papers thinking about analyzing Van Hoff plots and enthalpy entropy correlation or enthalpy entropy compensation. <clears throat> and the question that comes up is is this a mathematical artifact? or is this real, okay? When you do this simulation that I did up above <clears throat> and you do this perfect plot, notice the units of the enthalpy and the entropy. When you do the plot this way, the slope here has units of Kelvin. It has units of temperature, All right? And the slope is known as the compensation temperature. This experiment matches the experimental data here <clears throat> because that's what we were simulating in the Monte Carlo. The slope of this line is 277 degrees, something like that. It's, 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 it's something close to the actual minimum of the temperature range to the experimental data, okay? I think that's not right. What did I just say? Here it is. The compensation temperature is 299. Excuse me. That's tw it's 27 degrees, close to 27 degrees centigrade, which is the middle of the experimental data. <clears throat> so one of the adages that came out of the crude analysis was if the slope of that line is the experimental temperature, then that's a mathematical artifact. What you want the slope to be is something that isn't the experimental mean. So what we did was we went, took all of the data 
in this table and plotted the enthalpy versus the entropy. And then Krug advised that we should plot the enthalpy versus the free energy as well. And you'll notice in this, in these plots, we, we plot the enthalpy versus the free energy. And you can see that there isn't a great correlation here between the enthalpy and the free energy. And that was sort of part of the criteria that they wanted us to, to use in sort of the analysis. So we plotted all of the experimental data from various labs, enthalpy versus entropy. And the slope of that line is 278. So that's essentially uh, five degrees, okay? The experimental value is 27 degrees, something closer to, to uh, 300 degrees Kelvin, okay? And so these data are highly correlated. So you can see the R value here is 0.9. And the trend in the compensation temperature is different from the experimental data. Now, different is qualitative. There's no rule. You simply don't want them to be equal how different they have to be ends up being part of the arguments and you have to make part of the arguments. But basically that's what this data is showing that the reason that the enthalpy and the entropy are correlated is not mathematical, but it actually is due to a mechanism that is consistent with positive enthalpy, positive entropy, okay? The hydrophobic effect, the burying of hydrophobic surface. And the reason all of the data in this table and all of the data ever collected on tubulin obeys this is because that's what it is. It buries hydrophobic surface, all right? And then when we plot enthalpy versus free energy, they're also correlated, although not perfectly. And there are some outliers that we can explain away because they're maps or they're in the presence of colchicine. So there are other ligands that are involved. Actually, the colchicine is making an odd sheet-like structure, and the maps actually decorate the microtubules, so map binding is part of the process, which is why these data don't, they don't fall on the same line. But nonetheless, they are suggestions and consistent with a consistent interpretation of the data as being the burying of hydrophobic surface, okay? And so this entire discussion here, let me go back, this entire discussion about enthalpy and entropy compensation is basically arguing why it is that we believe these data to be consistent with the, the known mechanism or the best interpretation of the data and why the outliers are outliers and where we think those outliers come from. The map data actually had an unusual two-phase linear shape it would be linear and then it would break and it would be linear again and we knew that there was a map binding phase followed by a microtubule assembly phase so that was part of the explanation for the map data okay and then a discussion of the plotting enthalpy versus free energy was one of the criteria that they wanted us to use etc okay and so this is sort of the conclusion of this section that this positive enthalpy, positive entropy, negative heat capacity is consistent with the presence of hydrophobic effect, the presence of an enthalpy entropy compensation, and a number of different systems were discussed in this way. So the Sweezy and Samara papers are on actin assembly. No, that's not highlighted. On actin assembly. The Ha et al. paper is actually on protein binding to DNA, okay? And these all have similar Van Hoff plots and all are consistent with positive enthalpy, positive entropy, negative heat capacity. Okay. 
And so this is sort of the level at which we're discussing this. Now, the criticism of Van Hoff plots is that if other things are going on, it's sort of lost in the measurement, the burying of hydrophobic surface, the release of water that sounds sort of vague and general. Is there actually something else going on? Are there actually other kinds of things going on that we could maybe talk about? Can we say more than that? Okay, so one of the things that we observed, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, is that when you do electron microscopy on these solutions, you could see microtubules, but at the ends of the microtubules, there were sheets. And the sheets would close up into the microtubules, but you always saw some fraction of sheets. And so part of the conversation that's going on is, is as the hydrolysis correlated with local closure of the sheet into a tube or a rod. Okay. There's already data in the literature, primarily from Denny Chrétien in the mid 90s and some other people. This was done uh, by Robley Williams in the 90s, looking at the presence of sheets at a slightly different light scattering, but when we could visualize it microscopically, you could see that. Um, it turns out that the amount of sheet is a small enough fraction of the polymer. You can see here, sometimes really small fractions, occasionally more larger fractions, but generally speaking, these microtubules that are microns long <clears throat> would have sheet sections that would only be about 400 or so nanometers in length. Okay, and this was over lots of different conditions and lots of different times without hydrolysis, with hydrolysis, et cetera. And so we were trying to say something, I don't think this was ever definitive or even proven, how GTP hydrolysis is or is not a driving force for closure. It's pretty clear that you don't need hydrolysis to close. It's pretty clear that the presence or absence of hydrolysis, the sheets have a similar size. And so sheets have some intrinsic stability and they won't close right up to the very ends often. Okay, so that was one of the things that we were looking at. Okay. Um, the other aspect of this is what I just said to you. What else can you say about these data? Because the release of the hydrophobia, the release of water mechanism, as I said, is a little bit unusual or vague. <clears throat> what's un what's un unusual about it? Microtubules assemble in a very specific way. Their rods their rods that grow, they tend to grow along protofilaments. Sometimes those protofilaments grow together both at the plus, the, what's called the plus end or at the minus end, okay? They grow in a very specific way, okay? And so it's alpha, beta with the beta on the end. Hold on one second, there's somebody at my door.
that's what it says. Verify yeah. untrue. Right. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll give you more. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, my computer crashed when I came in this morning and it took me a long time to boot it up. They were responding to my cry for help. <clears throat> so I'm going back here. As a microtubule grows, it's alpha, beta, alpha, beta all along here. And with a slight helical stagger, every protofilament runs this way. So the plus end has beta on the ends. The minus end has alphas on the ends, okay? And the GTP binding site is on the end of a beta. So if I change the orientation here, alpha, beta, this would be the plus end, and the GTP binds right there, okay? And so when the next protofilament, when the next subunit comes in, it binds right there. So there are very specific interactions that occur between the beta subunit and the alpha subunit. They're so specific that the catalytic group that cleaves the GTP is actually on the alpha chain. It's not on the beta chain, all right? So there are specific interactions that occur, but I'm describing this as it's the release of water, the burying of hydrophobic surface. That doesn't even, acknowledge that there's a specific beta alpha architecture. And when it grows this way, the beta is buried, the alpha is on the outside, another beta alpha comes in, but now the GTP is on this beta and now it's gonna interact. And so there's a natural sort of weirdness to this. The GTP is sitting on the outside of these betas and it's not hydrolyzed until the next chain comes in, the next subunit comes in. When this one comes in, it immediately has a catalytic group and it can cleave. All of that I said to you is true if these protofilaments are not curved. If they curve, then maybe the interaction at the active site is displaced by a little bit, and maybe they don't have GTP hydrolysis. So there's, there's very specific architecture and enzymology that goes on here. Where's that in the release of water? Okay. Plus the protofilaments interact with one another laterally, okay? And that lateral interaction also is involved in burying surface, okay? So how does that influence the reaction? <clears throat> so the way that we analyze these data is to think about this in a slightly more detailed, although still a little bit thermodynamically vague way. And we've alluded to this in some of our others talking. Okay. The hydrophobic effect is the driving force for this reaction. Okay. Positive enthalpy positive entropy. So the positive entropy is favorable. The positive enthalpy is not, but it's due to the release of water. <clears throat> In addition to the positive enthalpy release of water contribution, okay, there's also specific interactions that might be going on. So at a high temperature, when suddenly the enthalpy becomes, becomes negative, all right, so how do we document all of this? How do we parse out, the word we use here is parse, out the contributions? One of the papers that you're covering uses the term parse. It means dissect out the enthalpic and entropic contributions, all right? So there's a negative heat capacity. The paper here <coughs> references a way of converting heat capacity 
and entropic driving forces in terms of other factors. One of the papers that we're going to talk about talks about something called a TS. Okay, actually, let me go back up here. I it didn't say something, and I know I didn't say it. In that, there's a table um, in the Lee and Timoshev. That's where I should have said it. There's a table in the Lee and Timoshev paper where it shows you the enthalpy and entropy at different temperatures. And there's a point where it goes through zero. It's positive, it's positive, it's positive. Suddenly it's negative. The maximum here is called TH. It's the temperature at which delta H is zero. If you go from positive to negative, there has to be a point in there where the enthalpy is zero, okay? And so it's usually the peak in a curved Van Hoff plot. If there's a, if there's a, temperature at which enthalpy is zero, it turns out that there's also a place where entropy is zero, so-called T sub S. One of you is presenting a paper on this, okay? And so T is equal to T S where the entropy is zero. It turns out that just like in the, the Lee and Timoshev paper, you can extrapolate where that is, okay? And the extrapolated value is 317 degrees, all right? That's a typical value for lots and lots of assembly systems. And so you can see that I did that for this data, all of these data sets extrapolated them all, and within some uncertainty, plus and minus eight, okay, it's all 317 degrees. And then at that temperature, at the transition temperature where Ts enthalpy is equal to zero, you can write down how much entropy is due to the heat capacity change. And this is the formula that came out of this Spoler and Record paper. The, the Spoler and Record paper has to do with proteins binding to DNA. And so this is the formula. You take the heat capacity change times the natural logarithm of the ratio of Ts over 386. And that gives you the hydrophobic effect entropy. Okay, and you can see a whole range of values because all of the heat capacities are different. Okay, so this is one of the driving forces or one of the contributors for the hydrophobic effect. In addition to the entropy change due to the hydrophobic effect, there is also something called delta SRT. Okay, and that is shown here, where we say that the entropy is zero at that temperature. Part of the entropy is coming from the hydrophobic effect. Part of the ent entropy is coming from this um, loss of rotational translational freedom. So when a subunit binds to another subunit, it's no longer as freely rotating. It's like the water being released and suddenly having more entropy. When a protein binds to a microtubule, it has less entropy due to its own rotational translational freedom. There's a number that is usually assigned to this loss. It's usually a loss of around 50 calorie per mole degree, okay? That's the number more or less that Timoshev, Lee and Timoshev and Friggin and Timoshev used. I think Friggin and Timoshev actually used minus 60. Other papers discussed in this paper have values that are around minus 20 or 25. Notice it's minus. 
loss of translational rotational freedom. So it's unfavorable, actually, from an entropic point of view. Okay. And then look back here at this formula. At this temperature, the total entropy is zero. Some of the entropy is coming from the hydrophobic effect. Some of the entropy is coming from the loss of rotational translational freedom. And then there's this vague other, which refers to conformational changes, conformational changes in the protein after the protein assembles. There's a hydrolysis event that goes on. So there's some conformational change that occurred. Okay, a phosphate is cleaved and dissociated. Okay, there are potentially other structural changes that occur along the lattice, either along the walls or along the protofilament that makes up the protofilaments of the microtubule. And so in this table, this number plus this number plus this number equals zero. And so knowing what this TS is, obeying the rules down below, you can calculate the hydrophobic effect entropy change. You can assume the loss of rotational translational freedom, and then you can calculate how much conformational change there might be. The conformational change is discussed in this paper as a measure of how much conformational change there is per residue, okay? And so that's why it's divided by 5.6 because 5.6 is the conformational change associated with a random coil to a folded structure. And so you can see that this number translates to a number of residues that undergo a conformational change. And so this is one way of thermodynamically analyzing the Van Hoff plot. You know that there's a hydrophobic effect. You know there's a contribution to loss of water, burying of hydrophobic surface. You know there's a contribution to loss of rotational translational freedom. And you know there are specific interactions that involve conformational changes, specific interactions between the binding site and rearrangement of part of the structure of the protein upon growing in the microtubule. And so this is what has become the traditional way of analyzing these kinds of data. This same analysis, as you'll see in, I think it's the paper by Baldwin. I don't remember who's covering that paper. Um, it might be Cindy. Uh, can, can also be applied to protein folding. Why does a protein fold? Well, often a protein initially folds because there's a hydrophobic collapse and a burying of hydrophobic surface. Then there's a loss of or a gain of rotational translational freedom, depending on all these residues are moving around and now they're less dynamic. And they form into some kind of a structure that interacts with other structures. You can break all of that down into similar categories and do a similar type of analysis, okay? And so what you'll see in that paper that we're gonna get to eventually is that there's some kind of a thermodynamic plot that crosses temperature. And this point corresponds usually to TH and this plot point usually caused the TS and it's the point where the entropy is zero, it's the point where the enthalpy is zero. And this is a kind of thermodynamic analysis that you'll see in this other paper having to do with um, the same temperatures that give you the place where the entropy is zero, the place where the enthalpy is zero. Okay, so we'll get to that eventually. Okay, and so this is the kind of analysis we've done and we've compared a lot of the numbers. Uh, one of the questions we end up getting into is how much of this is sort of believable and real. The diphosphate had the biggest Delta CP. Um, it corresponds to a huge amount of conformational uh, adjustment and we discussed in some detail what that really might be due to. But generally speaking, you can interpret this in vague ways 
admittedly, uh, to transitions in the protein. Now appreciate something. When this paper was published, we did not have the structure of a microtubule. We had no crystal structure of tubulin. We had no high resolution structure of tubulin in 1996, 97. Subsequently, we do. And subsequently, there's lots of specific things that one might be able to say about this type of analysis, okay? And so this is sort of an interpretation and a discussion of lots of different things, okay? And let's take a few moments to look at this, okay? Curvature in a Van Hoft analysis can have numerous causes. The primary cause is a heat capacity change thermodynamically described by these derivatives, change in enthalpy with temperature, change in entropy with temperature. Lee and Timisher described the large negative heat capacity they observed for microtubule assembly to release of water upon burial of water accessible surface area. Okay, now that's something that I haven't discussed a lot. It's discussed up above, okay? And we should look at that as we go through this. The hydrophobicity of the buried surface area is a major factor in this contribution. Okay, Spoler and the Spoler papers have indicated a significant contribution also to the burial of polar surface. So in the Spoler analysis and in all analyses now, when we talk about this, we talk about the burial of nonpolar surface and we talk about the burial of polar surface. And I'm looking for a delta AP. I'm not seeing a delta AP here, but up above there's some delta AP as well, where there's some polar surface burial, okay? And so the lore in the field has become that both of those contribute to heat capacity changes in different ways and different extents. And if you know how much surface area is buried, you can actually calculate how much of the surface is nonpolar, how much of the surface is polar. Or if you know the heat capacity, you can back calculate the amount of buried surface if you assume some fraction polar and nonpolar. Okay. Curvature can also be due to the effect of coupled reactions as described in detail by Eftink. So Eftink was talking about protonation reactions. That's Maurice Eftink, by the way. Uh, he's up at the University of Mississippi. He, I think he's still there and I think he's still a dean. So the idea is, is that something happens and then there's a change in a PK and a proton gets lost. Well, when the proton gets lost or a proton binds, that's a binding, that's a change in enthalpy. So part of the influence of the slope is a change in the binding of protons. The Lee and the Timoshev paper went through that, the binding of magnesium ions, et cetera, et cetera. So part of the curvat curvature can be due to coupled reactions. I mentioned the binding of maps, and oh, it's down below. I, let, let's, let me get to that in the, down below. Gaskin suggested that the curvature was due to a gross conformational change in the microtubule lattice, changing of sheets into rings, or changing of some kind of a conformation that's associated with GTP into GDP as the, as the hydrolysis occurs. That could contribute. Conformational changes in secondary tertiary structure that induce the burial of nonpolar or polar water accessible surfaces can also contribute to delta CP. Okay. In that table above, that's what we were calculating. Johnson and Borisi observe a break in their Van Hoff plot due to the formation of oligomers with maps and then. Uh, below 20 degrees that enhance the off rate by a dis disassembly of map stabilized oligomers. Okay, so different phenomena above and below 20 degrees. In addition, it has been suggested the contribution due to changes in internal dynamics or what are called vibrational modes. This was a paper by Julian Sturdivant, <clears throat> 1977. All that really means is that proteins fluctuate. And does that fluctuation change 
when they're monomers versus polymers? And does that show up in the general thermodynamics, yes or no? There's a lot of work done on that in the enzyme field and trying to understand enzyme mechanism, okay? Um, subsequent work suggests that that's a small contributor in an absolute sense. Uh, more recent analysis suggests that vibrational modes are negligible and do not contribute. Okay, that is actually still a little bit controversial. The release of water upon burial of both polar, nonpolar and polar accessible surface area, coupled reactions, conformational changes, all contribute to the curvature, okay? So in general, when I sort of wave my hands and I say, why is there curvature in a Van Hoff plot? The answer is burial of hydrophobic first surface, Ross and Subramanian. Positive enthalpy, positive entropy is consistent with the hydrophobic effect. However, the values of the, the, the magnitudes, the enthalpy and the entropy may be so big that they hide the contributions that are negative enthalpies or negative entropies, okay? The loss of rotational translational freedom is always gonna be negative. You just don't see it because the number is smaller than the number from the hydrophobic effect. You don't see the specific binding. You don't see the GTP hydrolysis because the number is smaller than the hydrophobic effect. Okay, and so that ends up being what happens. Okay, the loss of water upon formation is a process that should contribute a positive enthalpy, a positive entry, a negative heat capacity. The ionic interactions may also contribute to a positive delta, delta H, delta S. Notice it references Ross and Subramanian. Complete quantitative analysis requires a more complex interpretation involving burial of both the nonpolar and the polar surface area. Now, I haven't gone through all of that. <clears throat> That's discussed here in this part of the paper. We're beginning to run out of time. There are formulas that are published for what we, what, we, uh, what we think the contribution should be. If we knew the structure of the tubulin at the time we didn't, and we were referring to the people who eventually crystallized tubulin and they gave us some estimates of numbers. If we knew something about the amount of polar and nonpolar, we could then back calculate what the delta CP should be based upon the amount of nonpolar polar buried surface, et cetera. So if we knew these types of things, we could actually do some calculations to see if it was consistent. As we gained lots of information in the crystal structures, we could be more precise about this. <clears throat> I will tell you that the burial of surface polar, nonpolar specific interactions is a major area of focus in all kinds of protein-protein interactions, macromolecule and macromolecule interactions, because they have consequences for what the thermodynamics and the driving source are, okay? And so we spend a lot of time asking questions about that and talking about that. And the history of the field from my perspective, is the, 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 the Lee and Timoshev sort of analysis, is the Spolar papers, is the Acton guys who are working on Acton at the time. And all of us sort of use those as guides for how we think about protein-protein interactions, okay? And it, understanding what those specific interactions are and what the magnitude of the interactions are, okay? And so a certain amount of what's going on here is a discussion of how well we know these numbers and uh, how well determined they are and how, how big the burial is. Uh, this is where we're comparing the amount of surface. Uh, somewhere in here, there's a reference to the guy who gave us the predicted amount of surface that was buried. They were beginning to get a structure uh, in this Nagalis paper. It wasn't high resolution yet, so it didn't help a lot. Um, I'm not seeing 
the exact reference that I'm looking for, but nonetheless, that that's where we are. Okay. <clears throat> ah, this is this is more thinking about um, the extreme values and why the dinucleotide non-hydrolyzable analog gave such a big number. Okay, I'm going to get past all of this because we're about to run out of time. So what the point that I want to make is that when I ask you here or in a homework assignment or in a prelim question, a question about Van Hoff plots, everything that I just spoke about as described in these two papers, as described in all of the papers that I'm talking about extraneously, but certainly described here, is what you should be thinking about. What is a Van Hoff plot, LNK versus one over T? What's the slope? What's the intercept? Is it curved? Why is it curved? What else is there? Why don't I see rotational translational loss of freedom? Why don't I see conformational changes? Why don't I see specific interactions between the, the proteins in the lattice of the microtubule? Well, you do, but you don't have <clears throat> one contribu contribution to the enthalpy. You have multiple contributions to the enthalpy and they sum to give a positive value. And how would you get at them? I just showed you how you would get at them. Calculate the hydrophobic contribution, calculate or know the loss of rotational translational freedom, and then you can estimate the number of amino acids that are undergoing a conformational change. So the ultimate real criticism of the Van Hoff plot is that it can't see all of those individual steps. It just sees the sum of all of those individual steps. But as an educated biophysicist, you need to know that it's all there too. It's just hidden. And as you change the temperature, different things begin to reveal themselves. And suddenly the enthalpy is negative and suddenly the entropy is going to zero. And so you have to understand where it all comes from. So the ultimate criticism of the Van Hoff plot is all of that stuff is hidden in the plot. It's hidden in the graph. Ha ha, but if you did calorimetry, if you did ITC, maybe you would see individual steps. Maybe you would begin to see enthalpy contributions that occur subsequently. I titrate, there's an enthalpy change upon assembly, Oh, wait, there's a hydrolysis step. It's subsequent. Maybe temporally, it will show up as too little noise speaks or too little negative enthalpies that you can dissect out. Okay, so ITC data in principle is more precise and more accurate and more capable of resolving what might be going on. Okay, so what are we talking about next week? Next week, we're talking about drug binding to their targets. We're talking about the enthalpy and the entropy of binding. Is it enthalpically bound? Is it entropically bound? Is it both? <clears throat> and how do you interpret those data? All of the data in next week's presentation, in next week's paper, is ITC data. Because it allows you to see sort of behind the curtain and it's believable or more believable numbers and data, okay? <clears throat> and when we start talking about where the enthalpy comes from and where the entropy comes from, guess what we'll start talking about? Burial of accessible surface area. The same thing that I was just trying to get through here, okay? Because that ends up being what we will talk about, okay? So there's more to that conversation. It involves maximizing affinities. How do you maximize affinities? One of the papers that we'll be presenting will also reiterate that. So 
The class is not really done when we get to the papers because I'm really giving you papers that talk about the same ideas and make you be aware of how to apply this to other examples, okay? All right. So if you haven't figured it out, I'm sort of setting you up, right? For a prelim question. I'm setting you up for a way of thinking about this. I'm setting you up for a standard. It's not burial of hydrophobic surface, positive enthalpy, positive entropy, negative heat capacity, I'm done. There's more, <clears throat> okay? How much more? And do I ask it one question at a time? Do I ask it in a general way so that you have to give it to me? Not that I pull it out by leading you down the path, by pointing you in a direction and you say you fill in the gaps, okay? All right, I've gone on enough. Are there any questions? No questions. I'm good, Dr. Correa. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to meet on Monday at 10. Go over more questions. And then on Tuesday, we're going to go over the, <clears throat> the drug paper, ITC measurements of drug enthalpy entropy and interpretation of data. Take a look at that. I put a second paper out there which was a subsequent paper that um, uh, John Ladbury and Ernesto Freyer wrote uh, later, <clears throat> kind of a discussion of how ITC data is used. Um, but I, I, I gave that as sort of a compliment. What we're gonna really focus on is the molecular biology paper. And so I may flip to the other one at some point to make a point. But uh, basically, it really is a molecular biology paper, OK? OK. Anything else? Thank you, Dr. Gurria. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Have a safe trip this weekend. Uh, thank you. <laughs> it's going to be colder in Detroit. <laughs>